So tonight we're going to be looking at the Divine Liturgy. What happens? Somebody asked me, what happens during the Divine Liturgy? Now, I'm not going to be able to answer that entirely tonight. This is an introduction, obviously. And uh, let's see how we can get this. One second now. There we go. Uh, this is an introduction. This is just kind of a hit and miss. There's so much material. We're going to talk a little bit about the material so you can go right to the source. and You don't have to rely on a once-in-a-while lecture from me. This is what's really most important is that each one of us enters in experientially into the divine liturgy, which is in heaven, which is an event that happens and takes us into heaven. Now, we have a kind of, I think most of us, and I don't, I'm not, you know, it's not something that is surprising or blameworthy necessarily, it's just the way it is. We grew up in the Western world, we're English speakers, we're, we're surrounded by a very simplistic, rationalistic, whatever you want to call it, uh, idea about the divine. It's very uh, almost Old Testament-like. It's uh, it's you know, without a lot of direct experiences. So we have ideas about heaven that are very simplistic, almost childish, almost cartoonish. Uh, that's, any in any case, what we've been fed for most of our life. And you'll see, I think, at least tonight a little bit, you'll get a sense that it, the 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 incarnation and the continuation of the incarnation in the church means that heaven is has come into the world and is present in the church in the divine liturgy. And those who are worthy, those who are strugglers, those who are lovers of the God Man, those who God gives. Uh, because of their extreme humility and likeness to him, they give gives him give them direct access to the presence and the manifestation of the presence of the divine in the stories that we're going to tell. Most of the most of our talk tonight is going to be storytelling, which I, I think everybody loves, and I don't do enough of, so I'm kind of excited about it. So this is going to be. I'm going to start a little bit about just a few words before we get into the actual lecture and examples with the sources that I'm going to show uh, tonight. And one of the first source that I want you to, to point out to you, and I want you to t take notes. If you, if you don't got a pen and paper, get one now and write these down or put them on your computer somehow. One of the things we want to just uh, point out is the sources, as I said. And one of the sources that I like very much in, the, in English, at least, is this little book. You can see it here. Uh, and I'll give you a better version of it. Um, it's called The Church at Prayer by Elder Milianos of Simono Petra. Uh, Archimandrum Milianos of Simono Petra, The Church at Prayer, in Dictos, Athens, 2005. I think there's a new version of this. And I think the, dis the distributor here in the United States may be the Serbian Archdiocese of Los Angeles. I'm not really sure. I've had this book uh, for decades, so I don't remember where. I think I bought it in Greece. Uh, so... Let me just read a little bit from what the elder says. And I use this, by the way, if you were with us back during the first days of COVID, I use this extensively in one of my lectures uh, because he just drives home the imminence of the divine, in the divine liturgy, of the divine and the holiness of the divine liturgy. We have, of course, if you're new to Orthodox Jesus, we have a extensive course, 10 week course on the divine liturgy available through Crowdcast, available through Orthodox Ethos, 10-week lecture on the Divine Liturgy. That's going to eventually be serialized as uh, on Spotify. We also have utilized uh, a lot of material from Elder Milanos and others on the Divine Liturgy in our six-week course, Orthodox Survival Course, the one we did uh, on COVIDism, first one we ever did uh, here in uh, Crowdcast. That's also got a lot of wonderful quotes about the Divine Liturgy. So let me just read you one or two quick quotes from Elder Emilianos, and then we're going to jump into some wonderful events and, and miracles uh, to give us some insight in what's happening in the Divine Liturgy. What's happening in the Divine Liturgy? Um the church, my beloved, in which we are, have gathered along with every church is a type, a sketch, a model, 
an image, a piece of heaven. When we're in church, we feel we truly feel that we're in heaven. This is page 66. This is a uh, his essay or his lecture, rather, given in 1971 in Tricola, in central Greece. Uh, and it's uh, the Divine Liturgy, the Window of Heaven. All right, That's the name of the, of the lecture. So we truly feel that we're in heaven. What? Why is this great dome placed above us precisely to raise our hearts to heaven? Why are these royal doors here? which open at the start of the liturgy to show us how the heavens open up before us. Why is the church full of crosses? Why up there is Christ depicted celebrating the liturgy? Christ is depicted in many temples celebrating the liturgy to show us that when we are here, we are in fact transported to heaven. All right, so the divine liturgy is not on earth. You are not on earth when you are partaking of the mysteries and participating in the, the whole mystagogy, the mystery of uh, the uh, incarnation, which is the divine liturgy. Uh, you Now, you're going to say, well, I don't think of physically. I didn't, didn't go anywhere, did I? You know, well, no, but that's, that's exactly the point, is that this is a, a spiritual reality, a spiritual experience, and it is... Uh, not um, uh, something limited to space and time. In fact, it's ever present, right? And so we enter into something that's eternal. So all of the events of salvation, because they're carried out by the God man who is both God and man and is in and without uh, time and space simultaneously, is in heaven, is in Hades, he's on earth. Obviously, these things are surpassing any limitations of time and space. They're of God, in God, by God, and so to the divine liturgy. And he goes on, he says, this is why St. Gregory Palamas says that the church resides on high, being an angelic and transcendent place. When and where is the church made manifest most excellently par excellence in the divine liturgy? People say, Father, do I have to go to the divine liturgy? Absolutely. Only if you cannot absolutely get there, then we have other issues. But that's not something you choose to avoid, right? It's not, oh, I'm going to be an Orthodox Christian online. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm going to be an Orthodox Christian, uh, read my book, say my prayer and my rule. I actually have someone who who came to me recently or called me up, beautiful person, love talking to him, but he's in a situation which is really untenable spiritually. And I hope to God that he can resolve it. But he says, I only go to liturgy a couple times a year because I don't have anybody around me that I feel comfortable or trust. Uh, they're all ecumenists. And so therefore, I only go to liturgy when I go far away to another country. I'm not going to say details, but this is very problematic. This is very problematic. We need to be in the divine liturgy. We need to partake of the holy mysteries as often as possible. In the monasteries of the Elder Ephraim on Mount Athos or in America, they are communing basically three or four times a week. Three or four times a week. They're in divine liturgy every single day. Every day. Every day there's divine liturgy. And they're all there. In you know, for the unless you have a diaconium or you have a service and you're absent. You're there. All right. So he goes on. Quote, the elder goes on. It is an angelic and transcendent place that we are in now. He's talking to his people in 1971 in Tricola. The church tells us, raise man to heaven, and uh, the church, he tells us, raises man to heaven and presents him to the God who is above all. The church takes us and raises us up and presents us to God himself. These are not pious words. These are not desires. These are realities. If you and I don't have that sense, it's our problem. I want to really stress this. This is not like... Well, maybe it's like that for just the saints. No, this is the reality. This is not a subjective thing. This is not a wish. This is the reality of the church. And of course, it has presuppositions like everything in the church for our experience and participation in that reality. There's going to be presuppositions, spiritual presuppositions, because we have to 
apply the salvation to us. This is what's so sad in so many comments under our videos by various Protestants, especially apparently evangelicals. They come and they say, all you need is the blood of Christ. All you need is as, it, as if the objective salvation is sufficient. You don't have to apply it to your life. You don't have to become gods by grace. You don't have to go from the image to likeness. None of this theology appears apparently is in their life. They have no sense of the sanctification and the glory and the purification of man. It's just an automatic God imparted salvation to us. He imputed it. He, he said, there it is. You're saved. This is the mentality, unfortunately, of many heterodox. It's very tragic. Of course, that's not reality. You have to. We all are called. He says, Open. I stand at the door. He says, and I knock. It's not a one-time, come on in. It's a continuous presence, right? You have to constantly want to be with Christ. And the Divine Liturgy is the center of this reality of his presence in our life, in the world. And so, so important for us to be there often. I think tonight after, hopefully tonight, you're going to say, I want to be in the Divine Liturgy. That's my goal. Is that you walk away tonight and you say, I've got to be there, right? I've got to be there. And so just a few words more from Elder Emilianos, but so find this book, find this. I think this article might be online. I think somebody might have put it online as a PDF. Check it out. If anybody can search real quick and see, I think I've seen it online. Uh, maybe it's just the one on marriage. It's also a fantastic article if you're interested in something on marriage in this same book. But any in any case, I'm going to go on and I want to just read a few more passages and then we're going to hit the uh, PDF. Uh, so the church takes us and raises us up to God's will. But, but is that what we feel, he says? Is that our experience? When we come to church, does our soul have the means of perception necessary to sense and grasp these realities? Look at that, exactly what we're talking about. Uh, exactly what we're talking about. Do we have it? What sort of people have we become? We know all the breeds of dogs and horses. We know all the species of plants, the makes of motor cars and radios. We often fail to know those things which have a direct bearing on our life. And so I want you to pay attention to what I will tell you today. Isn't that beautiful? He is so beautiful, so sweet, um, so approachable. If we think about it carefully, we will realize that whenever we, whatever exists around us, the unfathomable depths of the sea, the heights of the heavens, the myriads of stars, all of this is nothing more than the poor little neighborhood of our planet. One day it will all be gone. One day it will all be gone. You've seen how the old houses are reduced to rubble when they want to build new apartment blocks. One day, everything in the universe will collapse just like that. Just like that. Nothing will remain. There will be only the spiritual heaven where Christ dwells. Let us then fix our gaze there. And of course, where is there? The church, the divine liturgy. We find ourselves in church, as we've said, it is the most suitable place from which to look at heaven. But where? is the window. Oh, this is beautiful. How are we to open it? The answer is simple. The window is the divine liturgy. The window is the divine liturgy, which we are celebrating. We aim to turn our eyes towards spiritual things. Let us therefore turn our soul to the Holy Spirit and let us ask him to shine his light on the darkness of our thoughts. Enlighten my darkness, purify me whom defiled, cleanse me whom stained, humble me whom proud and arrogant, chasten me whom slothful and lustful, teach me whom dumb. Enlighten my darkness, Lord. When he does, we will be able to feel, to believe, to understand, to make our own everything which is said and done during the divine liturgy. Let me repeat that. Let us ask him to shine his light on the darkness, into the darkness of our noose. And when he does, we will be able to feel, to believe, to understand, to make our own everything which is said and done during the divine liturgy. You have taken so much trouble to come here and on such a cold day, and you are standing. Your efforts should not be wasted. And so let us ask the Spirit of God that not a single unclear thought remain within us. 
I'm reading all this because I want you to I want to prepare yourself for the events of the divine energy we're going to hear about. And so this is a good, I think, a good prep. We shouldn't leave church in our hearts having not worshipped God. What a tragedy, huh? Can you imagine? We have the door open, the window. We go there, wherever there every Sunday. There's a lot of people. I don't know. I can't say for sure. I'm mean, who am I? Just another pathetic struggler here, but seems like there's a, as a pastor, I have to kind of pay attention. And I think there's a lot of people who go and come, go and come, go and come. And yet the window, they're not peeking through the window. They're not, they're not getting it. It's I think the proof is in the pudding, as they say, right? In in the fruits of our own life. Um uh, we shouldn't leave without having worshiped God. If we don't feel that our souls have been thrust into heaven, if we have not seen all that happens here. So important. At the conclusion of every divine liturgy, you should feel what a saint our church once said, now you have ravished my soul and I cannot contain your flame. So having sung a hymn to you, I go on my way. Now he's quoting St. John uh, of the Ladder, uh, Climacus uh, in uh, number 30. Uh, so we walk away and we say, I have been, I have felt, I have seen the true light. I've, right, I've worshiped the Holy Trinity as we sing. Okay, I could go on. It's really nice. I could read the whole thing to you just because it's so enjoyable. So Church at Prayer, Elder Milianos. I think there was a link uh, put up by uh, our good friend Justin. And so I recommend that to you. Now, next source, before I get into the, some of the events, we're not going to go through too many because we don't we don't want to get through so many. But uh, I want to recommend this book to you. I think it's available through St. Anthony's Monastery, Experiences from the Divine Liturgy. Let me see if you can get that. Experiences from the Divine Liturgy, right? Okay, this is Proto Presbyter Stephanos Anagnostopoulos. Anagnostopoulos. Let me see if you can get that better. Can you see that there? All right. The interpretation of the liturgy based on actual events and experiences of holy priests, monks, and lay people. Now, he, some of the stuff that he's got here is from our main source tonight, which I'm excited to tell you about because we're going to be publishing this in the future. It does not really exist. It exists in a translation. Translation can be reworked. But anyway, he does take from the, our main source. Uh, he takes from a lot of places, including his own experiences. This is a pretty massive book. I mean, we're talking almost 600 pages, 550 pages. And it is uh, commentary, but also tons and tons of events. So this is a great source for everyone who wants to go deeper in the experience of the Divine Liturgy. I would also recommend, just because I think it's so beautiful and so wonderful, this is the old version. They've got a new one now from Holy Trinity Seminary, Monastery, Press. Uh, of course, it's My Life in Christ by St. John of Kronstadt. If you don't have it, you need to have it. It's kind of a basic text in our contemporary orthodoxy since the you know beginning of the middle of the 20th century or whenever no beginning of the night of the 20th century when he published it and it circulated widely now we are going to be our first story tonight is going to be coming from um this book here well i'm going to be reading an excerpt from from another book but this book here now if you don't have this book you're missing out this is two volumes from St. Herman of Alaska Monastery, right? These are two volumes from St. Herman of Alaska Monastery. And they're absolute gems. This is, this is you've got to have this in your library. Unbelievable, beautiful, glorious, wonderful. It's right up there with our book. I mean, same kind of uh, literature. And I would say more complete because it's two volumes and everything. Our book that we published uh, last fall, and that is... Uh, the uh, Athenite Fathers of the 20th Century. Athenite Fathers of the 20th Century. Thank you very much, Justin, for the link here in Crowdcast. Uh, I wish we could do the same over there, but let me put it on the screen at least. Let me get this on the screen at least. But you can find it without me putting it on the screen, but it's, you know, it's helpful to see it. <clears throat> so... Let me just put a banner up here. And this is the, um, the 
the text, uh, the link for you. I'll leave it up there for a minute. And so we're going to be talking about an experience of the divine liturgy of Saint of of Savas the Confessor, Openev Matikos, or Savas Openev Matikos. And that'll be the first one we talk about. But I do want you to know the source because I think you need it in your library. All right. So these this is the skull of of the the holy uh, uh, saint. I mean, he's not glorified officially, but he's a saint of the church, Saint Savas, Open of Maticos. It's from this book, as we just said. And let's go right to the actual. Now, I'm going to read to you a bunch of other stuff before we get to this. So actually, I'm going to leave it on this page until we get there. I'm going to read uh, a bunch, and then we'll get to that actual ending of the story uh, in a minute. So this is about the value, this the, the, the importance of the oblation. Now, the term oblation is a little confused, apparently, in our translation, because it, it is mainly understood in English to be referring to uh, the the holy oblation that is offered on the altar and that uh, but it's also could be used and is used to pref to refer to the table of oblation or the table of preparation actually is what we say in, in greek the proskomovi e prothesi so you'll see that a lot in 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 english translations they'll keep the greek term prothesi or proskomivi and that is the table that's to the left of the holy altar where all of the divine uh, gifts are prepared. So we have the the round pathin and the chalice uh, where the bread and wine are put in and then these become the body and blood of Christ. And on the pathin you have uh, the, the amnos in the middle. I should have had an image for you tonight. I'm sorry. Didn't think about that. Uh, but you have the amnos or the main piece of uh, bread that's cut out of the prosphora, which means offering, basically. Prosphora is what's offered. It's the bread that, that is only for this purpose. It's baked in a particular way, offered by uh, women who are blessed to do this. Uh, they're living a, a, a chaste and ascetic life, and that's their uh, that's their diaconima, that's their service to the church. They bake these prosphora, and they bring it to the priest, and then, or in the monasteries, of course, they uh, bring it and, they're, and they have one in the Greek tradition, you have one main large prosphora, which uh, out of which is taken the piece which will become the body blood of Christ, the amnos. And then you have particles taken, of course, the large one on the left of, for the most holy theotokos, the panagia, and then nine orders of angels and saints. And then all the particles for the faithful, the, the those living and those reposed. And beginning with the bishops and the and the archimandrites and the elders, and then all the other faithful. That's what's on this discos or paten, and only the faithful are there. No non-orthodox are commemorated, even though this is a practice that unfortunately has been spreading among the those who don't understand or don't respect the holy tradition on this topic. They want it, I don't know, written in some book somewhere, but this is what's come down to us from the Holy Fathers. And this makes perfect sense ecclesiologically that this is for the church. It's just like the, the Lord said in his prayer uh, before uh, his uh, crucifixion, his high priestly prayer, where he, where he says, I pray for those you've given me, not for the world. Right. This is the time where the church prays for those that God has, has given the church. Uh, he calls, he brings, he is working among all the nations and the people to bring them to himself. And so these are those who've been given to the care and to the and become members of the body of Christ. This is the time for the prayer of the church, for the church and in the church. And this is the whole imagery on the pattern or on the discos. So in any case, we're going to talk about that in our first story, the value of the oblation. Now, the divine grace, it says this is. Oh, I need to say about this. OK, this is the book we're taking it from. All right. Let's see if you can. Miracles and Revelations from the Orthodox Divine Liturgy Monastery of the Paraclitos. Now, this is a translation done by my uh, under the supervision of my good friend, now reposed missionary to Mali, Malawi, and Tanzania, and then he reposed when he was in um, in Liberia uh, last. Was it last year? Has it only been one year? Father Ermolaus Yatru, and he gave me this book and. Um, 
he said, take it, Father, among other books he's given us. I had the blessing from the monastery to do this in English. They're yours. I want you to publish them. And now we're preparing these for publication. These are small, beautiful books. There's another one on the Most Holy Theotokos, Miracles of the Most Holy Theotokos. We're going to have to retranslate it, essentially, because it's a very, it's a, not a bad translation. It's understandable, but it's it needs to be improved, needs to be standardized. There's going to be a lot of work. So unfortunately, it's still going to be down the road. But I'm happy to, you know, provide a sneak peek before we can, uh, before it's circulating. Because it's really hard to find pretty much printed and then given to the mission field, from what I can tell. Um, I don't know how well, how much it circulates in Greece. I don't think much. So this is where we're taking it from, all right? And this is a lot of the stuff that, not a lot, but a good portion of what Father Stephanos has, you can, you can, they're coming from here as well. That these are all collected by the fathers at the monastery from all kinds of lives of saints throughout the ages. And so we have a lot of different uh, experiences here that we can that we can share with you. So the first one is from the life of the Father Savas, the spiritual father, Oponevmatikos, uh, from the book uh, Athenite, uh, Contemporary Ascetics of Mount Athos. The divine grace which spouts from the bloodless sacrifice is offered not only to the living, but also to the dead or for the dead, probably. Uh, see, the translation is a little sketchy. Okay, just looking at your comments. Now, getting back to the text. For this reason, priests never stop praying, not only for the health, but also for the rest of the souls of the departed servants of God. So in the divine liturgy, as you well know, we pray for the reposed and for the living, and that is a perfectly uh, wonderful practice of the church. I know there's, of course, the heterodox don't understand that among the Protestants, but this is the life of the church for 2,000 years, that we pray for the souls, the repose, and the even the betterment of the souls, uh, the, the, for the love, out of the love that we have for them, and the great power and mystery of the bloodless sacrifice which can be visited upon as you'll see in one of the stories at the end tonight all about how they are affected by the prayers of the church the greater the priest's faith and love is it, it, generally speaking the longer the list of the names that he often commemorates in the prophecy or the table of oblation sometimes confused with the altar this is the preparation table Father Savas, the spiritual father, Openevmatikos, a saintly Athenite figure, 1821 to 1908, he reposed in 1908, having a small body seemed to be an insignificant monk. But when he celebrated the divine liturgy, he looked magnificent, and his face was shining like an angel's face, in other words, full of light. In the uh, on the prophecies or the proskomidi, he used to commemorate a great number of names. He used a very big patent, and for two or three hours, he took out the holy pearls, as we say, margaritaria, the little pieces, tick, 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 the little tiny pieces that we put, and for each soul that's commemorated, uh, and he would go on for hours each morning. Of course, this was the his entire life was prayer night and day in his cell. And someone would ask him, oh, holy spiritual father, you must get so tired with so many names. Some of the fathers said to him with love. He said, no, I do not get tired. On the contrary, I feel great joy. It is very beneficial for the persons who are commemorated. Their own benefit is my joy. Father Savas, as a young priest, had had a revelation during which God revealed to him the big benefit that souls receive when they are commemorated. He wrote it down a little before his repose as a reply to those who kept on asking him, why does he commemorate so many names every single day for hours? And he wrote in, 19, in 1843, remember he was... He was um, uh, he was born in 1821, so he's 22 years old. In 1843, 
I was given many names to be commemorated in a 40-day liturgy. Do you know the practice that we have here that priests do in their parishes? Very common, uh, much more common in Greece than it is here, unfortunately. And that is that they'll do 40 days of liturgies and the, every single day for 40 days. So uh, that's continuous in the monasteries. Of course, they'll take names and you'll submit you know, the names. You'll say this date. And then they'll say, well, for 40 days since that date, we will commemorate these names. And usually the, the faith will give a offering uh, to support the monastery and as, as, as also a way of being thankful and as philanthropy in the name for the names, uh, for the sake of the names that are being commemorated, all out of love and not out of some kind of legalistic or otherwise uh, motivation, but out of love for the souls that are being commemorated and for the gratefulness for the fathers of the monastery that are commemorated. But many priests do this as well. I know one priest who's very prolific in 40 day liturgies. They'll usually do it the 40 days leading up to Christmas is very common. 40 day liturgies, or I've seen people do it for 40 days after Pascha, which is also a wonderful thing. So in 1843, I was given many names. On the day I was going to celebrate the last one while waiting for my elder to say the preliminary prayers, I fell asleep leaning on the book stand and I had the following revealing dream. Apparently, it seems he was made a priest very young. Because he would have been 22, and it, sound, it seems like he's saying that he was waiting for his elder to say the, uh, to to take keros is what we say, which means it's the prayers before divine liturgy that you see the priest saying. Uh, sometimes, if you're in the monastery, you'll see them saying it during orthros, during the uh, the matin service. You'll see the priests all gathered before the iconostas, and they will say these prayers, and they'll go and venerate all the icons. That's the so-called preliminary prayers. Here, I don't think that's the best translation. Okieros is what it's called in the Greek. Uh, and I think it's just kept that way in the uh, liturgicon of Bishop Basil. Keros. Now, <clears throat> he's waiting for his elder to come and for them to say these prayers, uh, I guess, at the beginning of Orthros or something, or before Orthros. And he falls asleep and he says, I was dressed, he sees a dream, and he says, I was dressed in a priest's vestment and I was standing in front of the holy altar. I think this is where we can go to the text. There it is. All right, let me give you the text. And let me get rid of the banner below. One second, because uh, we're done. All right, so I was vested in st and standing and standing before the holy altar on which there was the holy chalice full of Christ's blood. Then I saw an angel appearing as a priest and taking the piece of paper with the names from the holy table of oblation. So he's talking about proskomidi, right? He's talking about the proskomidi. He's taking the piece of paper, the holy angel, and the paper with the names from the holy table of oblation. He's approaching the holy altar. After he had placed the piece of paper near the holy chalice, he dipped the communion spoon in Christ's blood and wiped out name after name after name until all the names were erased and the piece of paper was totally clean. All right, so this is the vision that Opnevmatikos, and you see here is his holy skull. That's all we have. We don't have any pictures, of course. Um, no pictures were taken of him during his life. And he sees this vision and he tells his elder, about this vision and his elder says you are not worthy of forgiving the sins of those whom you have commemorated they have received forgiveness for their sins due to faith so he says look don't get all proud and arrogant because you're commemorating you think you're special no, no no this is because of the faith of the people and god's mercy and he says this dream is why i commemorate so many names Right? out of love for them and because he knows that God is clearly telling him by this dream, this is blessed, this is good, this is bringing about spiritual benefit uh, to the souls of those commemorated, living and departed. And so that's our first uh, story from this wonderful book that hopefully we will publish in the future. Uh, and there are many, many stories. I mean, we have in this book, we have about 150 pages and probably 
every page has a story or maybe a little bit less, maybe 120 stories in this from many, many lives of the saints. But I thought we would begin with the table of oblation and how important it is to commemorate names. We're going to end there as well tonight uh, when we get done with all the, all of our stories. Not tons of stories because it takes a while to get through each one, but a few just to give you a sense of what's going on spiritually that we don't see because of our inadequacy, our, our, our lack of love and lack of prayer. Now, this next saint is a, a very dear saint to myself because I was actually, uh, he was from, he's commemorated especially in Castoria in, in uh, northwest Greece. And I was actually ordained to the priesthood on the feast day uh, 20 years ago. 20 years ago in November of 2003, I was ordained to the priesthood. And this was the feast uh, on that day that the bishop was, it was a Sunday and we were commemorating him uh, because they have great love for him. And they, they have, I think, relics of him in Castoria. And so he's an important saint, unknown to most people. He was one of these great elders and missionaries and martyrs during the Turkish yoke in the 15th century, I believe it's 16th century. And so St. Uh, Jacob, who is in the middle here in this image, uh, he has a disciple, also Jacob, and another disciple, Dionysios. He was an Athenite, but he had spent a lot of time throughout throughout the contemporary Eladiki, uh Greek uh, uh, state. In other words, in mostly in uh, Central Greece and Western Greece. And he has he was doing the work basically that St. Cosmas did. You know, St. Cosmas at the Los did not begin this work of going and traveling throughout Greece and teaching and preaching. He was actually... Uh, one of the last before the revolution, revolution, and this had been, he had been preceded by many, uh, including Saint Jacobus. So now he says to his disciple Marcianos, uh, he tells him about the miraculous signs that he had seen during the divine liturgy, and he says, <clears throat> as he says, I saw the following: as the priest was putting on his vestments. There was a bright light coming from angels in front of him as the sun shines at dawn before it rises. And when he started the prophecies or proscomidi or oblation offering, four angelic orders came down and stood at the four points of the church. Finishing the proscomidi, the preparation of the holy gifts, the priest covered the holy gifts and with the holy veils, you know, the, the, the coverings that go over the chalice and the paten. And a bright light was showing upon them. At the time of the great entrance, when the holy gifts came out, a light was going in front of them. A light was going in front of them, which was covering the people. The same light encircled the holy altar later when the chalice was placed upon it. And outside this, uh, there was a bright circle. The angels were standing with devotion, not daring to approach the holy altar. The light remained on the priest during the whole of divine liturgy. An invisible flame was coming out of his mouth when he was announcing the prayers and was reading the gospel. When he raised his arms, his fingers were emitting light too. This reminds me, by the way, of the story from the Yerontikon, from the saint of the fathers. When somebody asked uh, a great elder, I forget the name of the elder now. I use this in one of my lectures at Jordanville on the Orthodox ethos. I don't remember the name of the elder right now, but he says to him, Yeronda, what is it to me? What does it mean to be filled with God, to have the spiritual life, to live in Christ? And he stands up and he he stretches out his hands and his uh, essentially out of his fingers comes, you know, a fiery light. And he says, this is what it means if you can be uh, like this, to be filled with God's uh, light and to, to, to be filled with the love of God and, and the spirit of God. And so here we see something similar. He raised his arms. His fingers were emitting light, too. Uh, this is the priest, uh, right? This is the priest who's in the middle of the divine liturgy. And this is not, he doesn't commemorate any particular priests. He says, this is the priest, right? So 
this is what's happening regardless apparently of the great holiness or not of the priest now that doesn't mean the priest understands that this is going on this great saint sees this reality the spiritual reality of the divine liturgy what's going on what's happening in the divine liturgy this priest is now telling us what's happening many priests have no clue of course that any of this is happening they're not made worthy to see and understand but some are after the sanctification of the holy gifts i saw the lord as an infant all right, so the Holy Spirit, he calls the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is descended, and he sees the Lord himself as a small child sitting in the place where the amnos is, where it's the bread that's been cut. He's sitting there on the path in, in a bright rainbow of light that's shining around him, like a, like a um, halo. The priest cut them, then cuts him into four pieces. Oh, my goodness. Can you imagine... Seeing this is many stories like this, by the way. Many stories in the spiritual medal of St. John Moscos, which, by the way, I have right here. Another great book. Another great book. We just posted something on Orthodox Ethos today about the miracles from commemorated in this book, the spiritual medal by St. John Moscos. And I think he's glorified. Somebody said today he's not glorified. I think he's glorified. He's considered a saint. Anyway. And uh, this is the papal Protestants put this out, so they call him John Moscos. John Moscos. Uh, anyway, and um, but I think he's a saint. And this is a phenomenal book, right? This is an ancient text, uh, the spiritual medal, all about the experiences that he's. It's like, it's like the Desert Fathers. It's like the Yerodikon. It's like the uh, Evergetinos, another great text. Uh, I think I've talked about the Evergetinos, four volumes, I think, in English. Very good to have as well. But this is filled with experiences like we posted on Orthodox Ethos. Maybe, Justin, you can post that article that we just posted today for everybody who wants to read more. All about miracles surrounding the question of the grace or gracelessness, rather, of the Monophysites. The question of the Monophysites. This is a big deal in the time of St. John Moscas. This is the 5th, 6th century. And so this is when uh, this great heresy, which is affecting really the ascetics, because Palestine and Egypt is where the, the heart of the the Monophysite heresy was, and so there's many stories in, in this spiritual medal of ascetics and the miracles from the divine liturgy, from the Holy Eucharist itself, showing the truth of the gospel, people converting from the Monophysites, the Severian sect, one of the Monophysite sects, to Orthodoxy because of the miracles surrounding the Holy Eucharist. So uh, going on in the quote here from St. Jacob or Yaakovos, uh, the Athenite, after the sanctification of the gifts, again, I saw the Lord as an infant sitting on the path in a bright rainbow. The priest cut him into four pieces, and his holy blood poured into the chalice from which the priest received holy communion. When the mystery was finished, I saw the divine infant unharmed again. All right, so obviously this is a spiritual event, folks. This is a mystery. Of, we cannot understand it as a, a gross, you know, uh, like... This is not something like a butchery, okay? This is a mystery that's being communicated to this great saint. It's very real. Mystery doesn't mean it's unreal. doesn't mean that it's not really happening. It just means that it's not understandable in the same way as we would within with a rational intellect, within time and space, within these limitations that we have in our life, right? So this is a mystery. When it was finished, the divine infant is unharmed again, ri rising up to the sky, into the heavens, in glory and honor, accompanied by the holy angels. So this is a, an amazing vision of the whole of the divine liturgy right here. You have you have a question, what is going on in the divine liturgy? Here you go. And the priest is shining throughout in the midst of the divine energies of God and this great mystery of the divine Eucharist. One of the great stories from this book, but there are many. Let's hear now from Russia. And the great Saint Sergius of Radonezh, you know who Saint Sergius is. Do you know? Do you know who Saint Sergius is? One of the greatest monastic elders of all time, founder of I think ten monasteries in Moscow, but one of the greatest monasteries, of course, that he founded, is to this day really the center of the of the Russian Orthodox Church, and that is the whole monastery of the Holy Trinity in Zagorsk, north of Moscow. It's where the great theological school is housed as well. And he's one of the most beloved of saints of all of Orthodoxy, but especially the Russian people. 
Every time he celebrated the divine liturgy, God made him worthy to have an angel with him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Would you be running to church? If that was the case, you would be running to divine liturgy. Every day you would be running to divine liturgy. Oh, my goodness. He was made worthy to have an angel with him at every divine liturgy. Once, his disciple, Father Simeon, who served as the ecclesiastic, the ecclesiasticos, the person who's in charge of the, the uh, all the details of you know the practical issues in the divine liturgy and the in the temple, he saw a flame coming out of the holy altar surrounding the saint. He was bathed in a divine light. When the saint readied himself to receive Holy Communion, the flame rose, formed the shape of a veil, and then sank into the chalice. After he had received Holy Communion, he stepped down from the Holy Altar and asked the astonished monk, my child, why are you looking so upset? <laughs> He's sitting there in awe. What did I just see? I can't believe I'm, I'm viewing this, right? He must have been overcome. And he says, Yeroda, Staritz, I was made worthy to see the grace of the Holy Spirit surrounding you. And then the saint became very grave. And in a commanding voice, he says, as long as I live, do not reveal what you have seen to anyone. All right. So another confirmation from another time, another place of the same mystery of the divine light. It's all about light. Everywhere there's light. Right. Everywhere there's light. And surrounded by light. Uh, John says, St. John of Kronstadt. I think you mean St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco is what you mean, right, John? Yeah, St. John of Shanghai has that light in Tunis, right? Uh, that's pretty well known. Yeah, we could definitely get that in the chat and Patreon. If you're in Telegram, we have a new chat for all the patrons, uh, but also that's not hard to find online. So this is another sign of the divine light, right? Very common in our experience of divine liturgy. It's the, the light of God. God is threefold light and appears as such to many, many saints. St. John of Chrysostom now, the great light of the universe who had the gift of clairvoyance, knew the future, knew many things that is impossible for God to know. This is one of the gifts of those who've reached theosis, who've, who are really manifestly of God. They have this knowledge of the future or of things that are impossible for man to know. And St. John had the same. We often think of St. John, I think many of us, as a kind of like a preacher, but he wasn't a severe ascetic. You know, he lived in a cave for a few years he was keeping himself standing through ropes. Uh, you know, he was in a severe ascetic, St. John of, of uh, Chrysostom. He had the gift of clairvoyance, often saw holy angels serving and guarding the temple throughout the divine service, and particularly during the time of the bloodless sacrifice. In other words, the oblation, the holy oblation, and the descent of the Holy Spirit. He saw angels serving and guarding the temple. He narrates to one of his spiritual friends the following. When the priest began the holy oblation, holy offering, immediately angelic orders appeared in shining and splendid vestments coming down from heaven. Barefoot and with heads bowed, they circled the holy altar and stood there in silence until the end of the divine liturgy. And then they spread around the holy temple to help the priest impart the holy communion to the people and to strengthen them in faith. You ask, what's going on in divine liturgy? This is the reality that we don't see, we don't experience because of our sins, our wretchedness, our slothfulness, our lack of prayer, our lack of love, our lack of humility, all these things that basically keep the door to the spiritual reality shut. But the great saints see these and they record them. And this is what's happening. Angels are present imparting divine liturgy. Uh, surrounding the holy altar. This and many, many other experiences. Now, from St. 
seraphim of serov. I'm just choosing a few, right? This representative. I'll read a bunch of contemporary saints at the very end, and then we'll open it up for questions. Saint Seraphim of Serov, one of the most beloved saints of the church. By the way, this is a, hopefully you can see this image. He's got the bear uh, there behind the on the right behind the tree. Can you see that through the uh, text? And Saint Seraphim is on the rock, thousand days and nights praying on the rock, as we all know. One of the most beloved saints of the church was strengthened in his struggles by divine providence through spiritual visions, which consoled his soul. As a deacon, I'm sure you've read this if you've read his life. He used to see holy angels periodically chanting and serving together with the monks during the services. And in one particular event, he says, once I was celebrating divine liturgy as a deacon on Holy Thursday. And after the small entrance and the readings, I humbly announced at the holy altar, Lord, save the pious and hear us, right? So, so, do, sev, sevis, as we say in Greek. Okay, pakus, onimon. And then I stood at the holy door and raised the orarion to the congregation and completed the prayer to the Trisagion hymn, and unto the ages of ages. And at that moment, a light shone in front of me. I looked in that direction and saw our Lord Jesus Christ with the figure of the Son of Man, shining brighter than the sun in a plentitude of light. Again, the divine light. He was surrounded by heavenly angelic orders, angels, archangels, cherubim, seraphim, like a swarm of bees around him, surrounding his feet and his, uh, at his feet. <clears throat> he entered then through the west door and was walking in the air. Something we see in the lives of many saints. They're walking in the air. So it's interesting. He stood opposite the pulpit. He raised his hand. He blessed the priest and the congregation. Now, the pulpit here is probably a bad translation. It probably means the ambo, which is where they give the homily just outside the holy doors. The pulpit is not someplace. Some Orthodox churches have a place where they read the gospel. The deacon reads the gospel or even the priest sometimes, but that's not. He's now behind the holy altar, it sounds like to me. That's what I mean. That's what I understand to be opposite the pulpit. He finally went into the place where his icon is next to the holy doors. So he then now goes back to the iconostas. Unless I'm misreading what he's saying here. Because he says he entered through the west door and was walking in the air. So it means he's in the holy altar. That's why it's a little unclear to me. It's not hugely important, but anyway. My heart was filled with elation and sweet love for the Lord. And then the person who's relating this says, it's remarkable that the vision took place at the moment of the priest's entrance into the sanctuary, which symbolizes their entrance into heaven itself. So again, we're not, when the, when the entrance happens, people think, oh, that's nice. They went out and they went in, right? Small entrance, the great entrance. People think it's just kind of movement around. No, these are, this is pointing that we're now entering heaven. Their entrance into heaven itself, it says. At that moment, the priest begs the Lord in a low voice, Lord, grant that the holy angels may enter with us and serve with us and thy holy goodness, right? And may and that together we may serve the, and glorify thy goodness. This is the prayer of the priest at the small entrance. After the entrance, the hymn of the angels is also chanted, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. That's when he saw this vision. And this vision proves that the heavenly orders participate in the liturgy with us invisibly. Every faithful person knows that he prays amongst angels, being in heaven with them in the divine liturgy. It makes perfect sense if you understand that this is an event that is happening in heaven, outside of time, eternally, always present, always happening, and then we ascend and we are present in heaven, then obviously we're in the presence of angels. The angels are serving with us. And this is a heavenly event, right? Not an earthly event. Now, this is a very interesting story. Before we go to some contemporary witnesses that I like to share with you all, because 
this will help you who are struggling maybe with your uh, thoughts about your priest and well, what kind of priest do I have? And is he any, you know, is he a good priest? Does he know what he's doing? They're young. Maybe he's a new priest. Maybe he's not a very experienced priest. Maybe he was a convert, never went to seminary. I don't know. Right. There's always something. And so listen to this story and follow along because this is something that should be teaching us. We should not judge. We must not judge our priest. God help us. Elder Ephraim would say, as I was told, that when you judge a priest or a bishop, one of two things happens. If the priest or bishop is holy, uh, you have a burning coal in your mouth. And if he's not holy and he's actually doing things that are not blessed, you have a coal in your house, which in your mouth, which is not burning. In other words, your, your mouth is filled with soot and it's an awful taste, all right? It's been an awful taste to have in your mouth a piece of charcoal. So if he's holy, it's burning your mouth. If he's not holy, then you have a you've been now filled with charcoal and your mouth is filled with black soot. That's what happens when you judge a priest, no matter what kind of priest it is and what he's doing. We're not talking about dogmatic errors. We're not talking about the preaching of heresy. That's a different matter. But when you judge him, on a personal level, he's bad. He's uh, he's ugly. He's stupid. He's he's uh, you know he's not pious. He's not he's a drunk. Like this story you're going to hear right now. Never a good idea to judge anyone. How much more a priest? Because he is, in spite of whatever errors, personal errors he's making, he is still serving this great mystery on the holy altar, right? All right, so let's let's hear about this drunken priest and what happened. And then I'll be posting that in a moment once I get it. In Great Lent, a period of intensified prayer, the church does not forget to pray for its departed children because the driving force of prayer, love, overcomes all obstacles of time and space, not stopping even before the boundary of eternity passing between the church militant and the church triumphant. That's an answer to all of those Protestants out there and all of you who are influenced or still around Protestants and you're saying, what the, what's going on here with this prayer for the repose, right? We can't explain that. We are praying for the repose, especially during Great Lent, of the souls uh, of all those who have departed, the Orthodox Christians who departed in the hope of life eternal, for whatever reason, they're might be struggling with uh, their eternal state because of the, a lack on their part. This is not purgatory, by the way. This is just the love of the church. We don't have any signs of a intermediate state. That's another issue, another time. The following instance that took place at the end of the 20th century is one, in one Greek diocese is a clear confirmation of this. Now, this is the end of the 20th century. It's not too long ago. About 25 years ago, this story came down to us. The bishop who told this story is still alive at the time of the writing of the book. <clears throat> it is genuine and has profound significance because it speaks of the prayers of the living for the departed. God always hears these prayers, especially during the divine liturgy. Another answer to the question, what's going on during the divine liturgy? Why is the divine liturgy the center of everything in the church? Well, right here, you're going to hear a story which shows just how much power and importance uh, the prayers offered in divine liturgy have and are for for souls in the diocese of this bishop whom we have mentioned there was a papa Ioannis, a father john serving a devout priest loved by all he would he was uh somewhat linger during the proscomidi in other words the prayer the service of, of preparing the gifts because he commemorated many names all right he would spend a long time as we saw with father sabas benematicos Commemorating many names. The but the priest had a terrible shortcoming. He had a terrible, we would say in Greek, kusuri, kusuri, right? Something that he couldn't shake. It was like a, you know, a passion that he couldn't shake. He loved to drink. He loved to drink. As diligent as he was in the fulfillment of his priestly duties, so powerless was he before wine. So very diligent on the one hand, very powerless on the other because of his love of wine, the poor man. 
Many implored him to overcome his passion, so unbecoming of a servant of God. The priest himself was aware of it. He was furious with himself. He tried to quit drinking several times, although everything would start again within a few days. Once when this Papuli, this priest, had again uh, surrendered to this passion, he went to church. He was half drunk, and he exclaimed, Blessed is the kingdom. And he began the divine liturgy. Oh, my goodness. By God's allowance, the priest slipped in the altar and dropped the precious gifts from his hands. <sighs> That's like the worst thing you could do as a priest. He froze with horror. Dropping to the floor, he began to gather the body and blood of Christ with his tongue. He was choked with guilt because it happened because of his intoxication. He was drunk, and this is why it happened. The priest went to his bishop and confessed his terrible sin to him. The next day, the bishop, after much thought, sat down at the table and took a pen. He had begun the process of defrocking Father Ioannis from the priesthood. He was going to defrock him. He was going to kick him out of the priesthood. The bishop's hand was lingering in indecision when he beheld, as if in a vision, how thousands of people, thousands of people were coming out of the walls of his room. Thousands of people were coming toward him. There was a burning pain in their eyes. Passing by the bishop, they cried out, No, Vladika, despota in Greek. This was translated by Jesse Dominic into it. Um, so he used Vladika, but it would have been probably despota in Greek. Do not punish this priest. Do not defrock him. Forgive him. The people were saying, coming out, as it were, from the walls and begging him not to defrock Father Ioannis, an endless stream of people passed in front of the bishop, men, women, children, all well-dressed, poor, a variety of people, right? An entire demonstration of souls. And they all stretched out their hands to the bishop and cried out, imploring him, no, your grace, don't do this. Don't expel our little priest, our Papuli. Papuli is Greek for a little priest, right? The beloved priest, Papuli. I think they in Greek or in Russian would be Vladiko or something like that, right? He remembers also and helps at us at every liturgy. He truly takes pity on us. He's our friend. Don't remove him from this great dignity. No, no, no. Do not defrock him. The vision continued for a long time. The stunned bishop watched the sea of faces pleading for the drunken priest. Oh, my goodness. He realized that they were the souls of the reposed whom Father Ioannis commemorated at the liturgy. And this commemoration greatly alleviates their lot, like water given to the thirsty in the summer heat. This is a clear testimony that our prayers assage the souls of the repose, the bishop thought. He called the, for the priest, Father Ioannis, tell me, when you serve the liturgy, do you commemorate a lot of names at the Proscomidi? Hundreds of names, Your Grace. I, have, I haven't counted them. Why do you remember so many names and delay the liturgy? The bishop asked, as if angry. Well, I feel sorry for the departed. They have no other help but the prayers of the church. And so I ask the Most High to grant them rest. I have a book where I record all the names that are given to me for commemoration. I inherited this practice from my father, who was also a priest, son of a priest. Well, you do well, the bishop agreed. Their souls need it. Continue doing this. Just be careful and don't drink anymore. Not a drop of wine starting tomorrow. This is your penance. You are forgiven. And truly from that day, Father Iwanis was freed completely from the passion of drunkenness. And now he stands even longer at the Proscomidi, commemorating the names of the departed. This is all commemorated in this book published in the 90s by the monastery of Paraklitos in Greece. And now I'm going to read you, without the text in front of us, stories from four different contemporary holy elders and saints in Greece, beginning with Papa Nicholas Planas, Saint Nicholas Planas. And then I'll talk about the second one in the right, in, on the, to the right, and that's um, Joachim Spetsidis, Spetsidis, I don't know how you pronounce 
Spet cities, I think, 1858 to 1943. And then to his right is St. Savas of Kalimnos, St. Savas of Kalimnos, a great saint. And then a newly glorified saint, Hieronymus of Simono Petra, who died in 1957. St. Savas died in, reposed in 1948. And St. Nicholas Planas in 1932. So this is all the first half of the 20th century the stories I'm going to read you now from these great uh, holy ones of the church in Greece. And we begin with St. Nicholas Planas uh, here on the left. St. Nicholas, a great saint of our time, celebrated the liturgy every day without any break for a period of half a century. Sometimes it happened that he did not have any altar bread. In other words, prosphora. Nevertheless, he always found some, either from the faithful people or from bakers in the neighborhood, because he wanted to celebrate the liturgy every day. One day, although the, at dawn, the dawn prayers had already begun, I think what they want to say here is the Messinictico, the service of Messinictico, nobody had brought in a prosphora. So he's wondering what, or maybe it's orthros, actually, yeah, the service of orthros is what they want to say here. And so he's getting worried. He's got to do the proscomidi during Orthros. Where is the prosphora? He sent somebody to look for some, some either in the baker shops or in somebody's home. He also looked for some in the cupboards of the sanctuary in case another priest had left any, but in vain. And he was worried to tears. He won't be able to celebrate the divine liturgy. Suddenly, he was seen standing at the holy door holding a very fresh prosphora. He had found it on the holy altar, suddenly, from nowhere. And he exclaimed, my children, look what sign I've been given by God. And he was moved and was joyful. He used the word signs instead of miracles. He considered them quite normal because he had great faith. In saints' lives, we meet hermits who are, now, who are served by an angel of the Lord. It is very normal for Father Nicholas to be served by an angel of the Lord as well, because while he lived in the world, he was a real hermit. Have you all read the life of St. Nicholas Planas? Do you know about St. Nicholas Planas? And he lived as a real hermit in the middle of Athens. Plenty of his parishioners, particularly small children, saw him literally in the spiritual uplift during divine liturgy. He would be lifted up off the ground. A respectful woman narrated, Father Nicholas's reputation was spread all over Athens. Once, on Christmas Eve, I set off with my grandchildren to receive Holy Communion from his blessed hands. At that time, Vulyagmeni was still a deserted area. That's where he was serving in Athens, downtown Athens. There were 20 poor houses dispersed here and there surrounded by fields. Actually, it wasn't downtown Athens. I'm sorry. It was a little bit out. That was before Athens became a total... Five million people moved in. And so he's in Vulegmeni. There were not many people. In the place of today's church, there was a small old Byzantine church, small like a baldachin, ball, low and half dark, very small church where he served. Other families with their children had come too. At the moment when Father Nicholas appeared at the holy door holding the holy chalice, my grandchild shouted, Grandma, the priest is walking in the air. Stop it, I told him whilst the at the same time I made the sign of the cross. How is it possible that he's walking in the air? I can see him too, another child shouted. He's not walking on the floor. When he announced aloud, in the fear of God and with faith and love, all the women and children approached to receive Holy Communion. Father Nicholas had not heard anything, but even if he had, he wouldn't have paid any attention to it. Since then... I had been count, coming here to receive the Holy Communion, and every time it was impossible for me not to hear children shouting, the priest is walking in the air. <laughs> every time she would come, the children would shout. In 1920, on Christmas Day, the saint was celebrating the liturgy in the church of St. John of Vulyagmeni. In Vulyagmeni. When he came out to impart the Holy Communion the faithful to the faithful people, a woman with her baby also approached. After the baby had received the Holy Communion, it was given to a girl, Julia, to hold in her arms. 
As Julia was holding the baby, she turned and looked at the priest. Then she nearly dropped the child onto the ground. The woman shouted at her, what's wrong with you? Be careful with my baby. I can see the priest standing on a cloud, she replied excitedly. I can see the priest in the air standing on a cloud. And yet another time, while the priest was celebrating the liturgy in the church of prophet Elisha, that was where he celebrated most, the following event happened. A child eight years old came out of the sanctuary quite pale and said to his mother, Mommy, Mommy, Father Nicholas is so high up from the earth. And he showed her half a meter with his small hand. As you can see, St. Nicholas was not a large man, but he was not a small man either. And obviously, it was impossible for him to be off the ground without God's great grace. Uh, this was, you know, a sign in many lives of the saints of the great holiness. You can see this in other contemporary saints as well. Uh, I think Saint um, Papa Dimitri Gagastafis, I think, if I'm not mistaken, was also seen off the ground. This was the great priest that Elder Emilianos would serve with when he was in Meteora. He would go to Papa, uh, Papa Dimitri Gagastathis and serve, uh, or Papa, Papa Dimitri would come to him at Meteora and serve as well. All right, now from the next priest on to the right of St. Nicholas, this is Joachim Spetsides. Excuse me. He was a monk priest, and he narrated the following experiences of his during the period of his residence at the monastery of St. Savas in Jerusalem. On the fourth Sunday of the Great Lent in 1888, the priest monk, Germanos, was celebrating the liturgy. He was a typical real monk, simple, harmless, naive, meek, and humble. After the great entrance, when he came out of the holy door to bless the congregation, his face looked like a fiery, fiery flame. What's wrong with Father Germanos, I asked Father Surreal, thinking that something bad had happened to him. Silence, he told me. He is in spiritual uplift of the divine grace. He's, he's being lifted up by divine grace. Spiritually, he does not live in this world any longer. He is in heaven. Don't you see that he is moving mechanically as if he is absent-minded? It happens every time he celebrates the divine liturgy. When I was ordained as a priest one day, I asked Father Girmanos, Father, I have read that in earlier times, many priests during the great entrance uh, were holding the holy gifts and they did not walk on the earth. Are there such priests today? This is now Father Joachim asking the priest he had saw, lifted up and full of uh, like a fiery flame. He's asking him at another time, are there such priests today? And he tells me, do not doubt in case that such a thing happens to you as well. Indeed, the following Sunday, I was going to celebrate divine liturgy. So when I came out for the great entrance during the holy gifts, I was lifting up my legs as I could not find solid earth to walk upon. This is the Yo Father Joachim himself now saying that he had this experience of being lifted up and levitating. I'm looking at your comments. I'm, who's saying this is this is demonic? Well, it certainly could be. De the demons could lift somebody up. Yes, that's true. But it's obviously not what's happening in the middle of divine liturgy. I was lifting up, he says, my legs as I could not find earth to walk on. Later, Father Germanos visited me in my cell and asked me, why today during the great entrance were you lifting up your legs? I don't know what happened to me. I could not find any solid earth to walk upon. Exactly. You were in the air because angels were holding you. Well, believe and do not inquire because of the Holy Eucharist is a great mystery. 
Father Gabriel has told me. Only during the great entrance do the angels lift up the priest in the air, I asked. Yes, because at that time he carries the holy gifts. When he places them back on the altar, then the divine grace enlightens his intellect, which is in the spiritual up, uh, uplift in the bright and heavenly world. So the angels are serving God, and he is carrying the holy gifts, and so they carry the, the priests. That is from this priest here in the middle, on the left, Father Joachim. Now we're going to go to St. Savas, who's the third from the left, with the nun, who's sitting there with the nun. St. Savas has the following stories. Forgive me, I'm feeling dehydrated right now, and so I'm drinking a lot of water. Our, our contemporary St. Savas, 1862 to 1948, protector and patron of the island of Kalimnos, celebrated the divine liturgy with perfect devotion to the holy mystery. Many times he talked with the saints while serving the divine liturgy. One, particularly, uh, one particular time with the three hierarchs, St. John Chrysostom, St. Basil the Great, and St. Gregory the Theologian. Well, at the same time, he was surrounded by the angelic orders. At the, I actually had the blessing when I visited Patmos to go down and spend a day at the monastery of St. Savas in Kalimnos and to visit his cell and to visit his chapel and to visit the church and his relics. It was really a great blessing. It's high up overlooking the island, just so beautiful in the GNC. And his little chapel is just tiny. I mean, his church where he served for many years before the church was built was basically one very small altar and one very small, two people could sit maybe, a three. That's what I remember from visiting. And it was uh, really, uh, what a blessing to visit and venerate the place where St. Savas lived. At the time of the Holy Communion, as other priests or faithful people had noticed, the content of the chalice was rising and nearly overflowing, but the Holy Communion never poured out of it. Listen to this. Content of the chalice was rising and nearly overflowing, but never poured out. Once, Niki Kutuliana, later nun Salome, saw the saint at the oblation, the offering on the holy altar, lifted up while angelic order, orders were standing around. So this was a vision of a, of a future a future sister of the monastery. She was a lay, lay woman at the time. She saw everybody, the saint uh, lifted up and angels gathered around him. She also noticed that the content of the holy chalice was rising. So it was like bubbling up. The woman was scared, but she did not speak. Later, she revealed what she had seen to St. Savas. And he said to her, oh, my child, for God's sake, do not say anything to anyone about this. Reminds you of the, the Lord. The Lord didn't many many times he said, Don't don't say anything to anybody about the miracle, he said. You know, very interesting. Now, the last uh, but not least at all, the, the newly glorified Saint Hieronymus of Simono Petra, the on the far right, you have two images of him as a young monk and then as an older monk. This is uh Archimandrite, now Saint glorified Hieronymus, abbot of the Athenite monastery of Simono Petra. This is long before the contemporary brotherhood went. This is back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, he had been serving as a spiritual father in the dependency of the monastery in Analipsy in Athens. I've been, I actually visited this beautiful little church in the middle of Athens, the uh, church of the Ascension, the Ascension, the feast we're going to celebrate in two days, in Athens. He was there as a spiritual father. It was by God's economy so that the saintliness of the elder or of blessed memory shone in the capital as well. And many souls were guided to salvation. As a priest, he was characterized by undistracted devotion to the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. When he celebrated the liturgy, he seemed to be in a spiritual uh, elevation. He, he was lifted up. From, from the faithful people who had gathered to attend the Holy Mystery, many children saw him lifted up. 
and and high off the ground, and they shouted, "The priest is flying! Look, the elder is walking in the air." And none also saw him as he was coming out from the great entrance, walking in the air instead of climbing down the steps of the north door of the sanctuary. Another nun narrated that many times during the divine liturgy, they saw the elder in front of the holy altar, lifted up from the ground, uh, and, the, and a young Ven Venetia, who later became a nun, when she was about five years old, in a liturgy she saw with her innocent eyes the angels around the holy altar. And those days, in those days, the elder face was spiritually changed. And for a long time, the little girl did not want to enter the church, but she watched through the front door in total awe at what she saw. One winter night, while it was raining heavily, the elder was given notice to go and give the Holy Communion to a sick man. He set off immediately for the sick man's house, holding the Holy Communion. The miracles, the miraculous event is that on the way, he did not get wet at all. He did not get wet, even though it was raining very hard. Just like St. Paisius, by the way, another miracle in the life of St. Paisius, the same thing. All right, so that's just a few little tidbits from this beautiful book, which, God willing, we will publish at Uncome Out and Press, a, a revised version, a new translation, along with uh, another book uh, of Miracles of the Mother of God in the near future. That's probably going to be a good six months to a year away before we get that uh, published, if not longer, because it needs to be retranslated. But you got a sense of very recent holy elders and saints, and there's many more uh, that we could read uh, from. But all of this, what is going on in the Divine Liturgy, brothers and sisters? What are we witnessing? Uh, what are the saints witnessing, rather? Uh, a great mystery and a great and glorious uh, event here is happening. Uh, the, the angels are present. The Spirit of God is present. The divine light is shining. The Lord himself is present and in invisible uh, angels and saints are seen. We could, we could have read from the life of, of uh, Papa G uh, Dimitri Gagastathis, that recent priest who I think reposed in the 70s, who was with Elder Emilianos. And he talks about doing divine liturgy with saints and angels. And he, and he names the angels and saints that he would regularly have divine liturgy with. And Elder Emilianos uh, as well, talks about these events in the Divine Liturgy with Father Dimitri. And this is just in the 1970s. So this is the experience of the church for thousands of years that heaven is on, uh, is come, or we're, we're actually elevated to heaven. I don't like the, the expression heaven on earth because some people take that as a, as chiliasm or something like, you know, we're, we're externalizing. This is not anything like utopia or anything like chiliasm or anything like this idea that we're going to bring externally like a, a heaven on earth in the chiliastic sense. This is a, what it is, is that in the confines of the divine liturgy and in the temple of God, those who have, who are prepared and have fulfilled the presuppositions essentially ascend to heaven and dwell with the angels and the saints and commune uh, directly at the altar of God uh, and uh, of the holy mysteries. This is the mystery so you have um, your reading cut out for you. You have this future book. You have the Spiritual Meadow of St. John Moscus. You have Elder Milianos, the Church at Prayer. You have the uh, Contemporary Ascetics of Mount Athos. You have Saint Life of My Life in Christ by St. John of Kronstadt, which has so many experiences from the Divine Liturgy. You need to read his life, by the way. Uh, that's from Holy Transfiguration Monastery. I don't have it right here. I, I took it to my the other room to read. The Life of St. John of Kronstadt from Holy Transfiguration Monastery, a very wonderful read. And then this book, which is available, Experiences During the Divine Liturgy from, pa from Papa Stephanos. All right, let's open it up to questions and look forward to hearing your thoughts, your questions. Let's go right to the question box. And we've got basically two questions right now. Father Bless, if one has had several spiritual experiences... During Holy Communion, should one keep them secret or share them or ask one's spiritual father first? You should go to your spiritual father and you should always, if you're, especially if you're uh, new or a catechumen or uh, don't have a lot of experience, you should always take those to your spiritual father and ask him or, or an elder or a priest or whatever, somebody you can uh, submit that to and see 
uh, what they're going to tell you and not trust yourself. I think that's the wise way. All right, Alexandra. Um, okay, yeah. So that that's what I would do. Go to your spiritual father. Saint Simon, new theologian, emphasize presuppositions for receiving the holy gifts. This is a question from John Kaufman. Uh, Weeping was required, according to St. Simeon, New Theologian. A perceptible and tangible, visible awareness of the activity of divine grace determined if one was receiving the benefit of the Lord's body and blood. St. Simeon also says, <clears throat> uh, just one second. St. Simeon also says, to not have these presuppositions invites the envy of the demons to make things worse for the Christian. Should this standard be st still the expectation today for us, even though this would be bar so many from Holy Communion? Is the lack of such expectation one reason why so many have given rights to the demons and, and fueling the chaos inside the church today? Uh, I believe, John, that... I don't know of any spiritual father today, Elder Ephraim or all his spiritual children, who would take this and apply it in just a kind of matter of factish across the board way. And the experience of one ascetic and one great saint, which is, of course, extremely important. I don't think we can say now um, we're going to apply this across the board and in, t in today's climate. I don't think the Lord, um, how can I put this? The, if you look at the Yorodikon and they talk and they talk about the, 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 the Christians of the last days, they do not hold them to the standard at all of the Christians of the of the earlier times. Doesn't mean the standard is no longer important, but the circumstances of their life, the temptations that are surrounding them. The lack of initiation, all of that, certainly, if we as human beings can be compassionate and condescending to that, how much more our Lord? Uh, what does that mean, though, We're, that we have to remain extremely low to the ground in the sense of be on guard continually for any kind of being puffed up or proud because it's clearly going to be delusional if we don't have we don't fulfill the presuppositions you're talking about. We don't have the life and experience of this great saints. Then we're 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 going to be saved basically through, uh, you know, a if not the thief on the cross kind of experience. We're going to be saved through the great mercy and love and compassion that the Lord has shows again and again. So, um, what, but uh, sit, alongside saying that, which I think is an important you know, consideration uh, of what are the what's the impact of all this, the lack of presuppositions being fulfilled. Uh, one can certainly say that communing without, I mean, presuppositions that are not even mentioned here, but basic, basic presuppositions that spiritual fathers talk about today, there's people, all, all kinds of people communing without those presuppositions. For instance, abstention uh, and fasting, not just from food, but sexual relations. That's the kind of thing that gives rights to the enemy that you're talking about, fuels the chaos and all the rest. If, if this is in effect, and certainly that is much more in effect, um, the kind of thing that happens where you have spiritual fathers you go to for, let's say, a very common, you'll go to a spiritual father uh, or a priest and you'll say something like, you know, I have this chronic sexual addiction or this whatever it might be. Uh, and they'll say, OK, go go in peace. No, no method, no method of curing, no therapeutic application, no abstention from Holy Communion. They commune the next day. And then they fall again the next week into the same sickness, right? The, whatever it might be. Uh, that is the kind of pastoral, spiritual uh, 
disaster, chaos. I mean, how can that, that's not even remotely an application of the method, the, the, the uh, therapeutic method of the church and the canons from, you know, from the saints. I think that's what's causing the great chaos. I think the Lord in his great compassion sees how far we are from, from what was a given in the days of St. Simeon or even the days 150 years ago, there was a, an ascetic life that was being led by simple people because that's just the way life was, right? So we're so far from that. There's so many things we don't have that was taken for granted for other generations. Certainly the Lord's going to take, take that into consideration. And he's going to say, well, in this case, we have the economy of salvation that 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 he he's going to he alone can understand and apply. Uh, so I think the I think the general structure of there being rights given because we don't keep the presuppositions is true. But what are those presuppositions for our generation is not necessarily the exact same thing that St. Simeon was saying across the board, because we have so different circumstances and we're coming from such a different place then St. Simeon would have been coming. Uh, that's just my take. I don't know. Maybe that's wrong. I don't want to relativize in any way what St. Simeon is saying, but I think you do need to, just like everything that the saints say, you need to apply them in the, the context, right? And understand them in the context of today's uh, church uh, without saying that the principles that he lays down are not applicable, but the particulars, I don't know. I mean, if that's the case, like you said, who would commune? Um, uh, just to go back and say what you related here is we should all be weeping, literally have tears flowing, a visible awareness of the activity of divine grace, determined if one has, was receiving uh, the benefit of the Lord's body. But So the fruit of our, our reception is going to be a visible awareness of the activity of divine grace. And if you don't have these, then you're going to provoke the demons. Uh, now, it, it doesn't mean that uh, he, I don't know, at least not here, he's not saying don't commune. But you, it's dangerous. It Maybe that's how I'm seeing this. I would need to see the whole text in context, though. I don't want to misrepresent it. All right. I think that's the answer I have for you right now. All right. Sorry I didn't hit the button, but that's the answer I just gave it. And we'll go to the next question. Anna has a question. Your blessings, Father, you mentioned early on in the intro that Jesus would suddenly come. I did? I don't remember that. Will the divine energy that is always happening in heaven simply be opened up upon us? Well, there's going to be the judgment. It's all going to happen in, 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 a, in a moment, essentially. Yes, it's going to be the Lord coming and separating the sheep from the goat. I mean, we're going to, we're going to go where we love. We're going to be united with what we love. And so I guess you could say that we would be immediately before and in the presence of God in, in terms of uh, participating in the divine worship. But I don't think I said he would sudden, I mean, the Lord will come suddenly. Yes, that's true. I don't remember saying it in this talk, but in any case, um, we, the the faithful will have many signs that the that the things are coming right, but there will be no sure knowledge of the exact moment. But there will be many signs, and there are already many signs that the Lord has told us about in the gospel. Uh, so Macrina has a question relating to the angels serving with the priests. Do our guardian angels worship with us? Um. I'm not sure that they mentioned that it was his guardian angel, but it may have been angels that are serving in heaven, the divine liturgy. So I'm not sure, but certainly our guardian angels are with us. So that should, hopefully that should answer. They're certainly with us and they're certainly worshiping God. Nancy has a question. Sorry, this is not directly connected to the signs and wonders. Where are... Adam and Eve now that Christ pulled them out of Hades. My daughter asks all kinds of questions of me. I'm, I'm, I tell her I'm inadequate to speak and soon she'll need to come and see. So all of the righteous are in are with Christ in waiting the general resurrection. Uh, they're in paradise, but they're not in the kingdom of heaven. They're in a state of expectation and joy 
but they're not united to their bodies, obviously, and they're not, the judgment is not come, and so they're not in the kingdom of heaven. Uh, but those who have done righteously and lived with God and embraced God, accepted his truth and all the rest, are in a good place, obviously, or are not suffering, and they're waiting uh, the uh, the judgment, the second coming, and the and the general resurrection. So hopefully that answers your question. Well, now we got three more questions. Father, are the Jesus prayer and the Most Holy Theotokos prayer the two biggest ones? Or are there other ones? Um, well, certainly the most go-to pr prayers that we have on a daily basis, they're short, to the, the point. They're the ones that are done in the monasteries by and large. Um, we, you know, we don't, we have tons of services, akathis, supplication services, canons, they're endless. Uh, but the short prayers uh, that we, we would be saying on a, uh, you know, like the Jesus prayer, they're pretty, pretty much the Jesus prayer. Most of the will save us. You can also say, Holy Saint of God, Peter, or whatever it is, pray to God for us. Uh, that's done with the Jesus prayer as well. And then there's short morning prayers of the saints, many morning prayers of the saints that you can say. There's other prayers of contemporary saints like Elder Shafroni or uh, Elder Paisios, Porfirios. They have different rules and saints in their lives. If you read the lives of those saints, you can pull things out that they were doing and using. But generally, yeah, the Jesus prayer is the go-to. Yeah, the Jesus prayer is the go-to. I just answered that. So now let's go on. The next one, uh, Jacob asks, will you be translating some of St. Justin Popovich's work anytime soon? Uh, I don't, we don't have any plans to translate anything by St. Justin Popovich because most of, a lot of it's in English that we know of, except his dogmatic theology, which we heard years ago was being translated and will be published by St. Herman of Alaska Press. Uh, that is the massive dogmatic theology I, I have in Greek here, but doesn't exist in English yet. I hope the St. Herman Press is still doing it and will bring it out. But it's a difficult text. I mean, it's massive. So, But that would be very valuable. Uh, I would love to reprint Orthodoxy and Ecumenism, which is basically out of print. And we'll see if we can get rights to that and reprint that. But fresh translations are not on the horizon, no. The other book, Experiences During Divine Liturgy, is is uh, is available from St. Anthony Monastery. Did you guys look on that? Can somebody find that? Yeah, but look at the five star ratings for that book. Yeah, it is pretty amazing. He did a it was, that took him years and years. He told me when I talked to him twenty years ago, and he wanted me to help him translate it. Somebody else ended up doing it. Uh, that that was a lifelong project father stefanos it was a lifelong project that he had worked on and he had he had told me i remember distinctly he had told me when i was talking to him this is about 2007 um that he had been told by elder Ephraim, uh work on these projects he had several books that came out in the last 15 years basically you know, spend years doing it, perfecting, it, and then bring it out. So he was, he was, it was very intentional and a very long project. I mean, it's a very large book, 500 pages, and lots and lots of personal experiences he had as well. Well, there you go, Christopher. Thank you for putting all those links in one thing. Let me, let me, um, well, we pretty much shared them all except Spiritual Metal. If we can find the Spiritual Metal link to the Cistercian Press, that would be good to share because that's a great, great book. The Spiritual Meadow is a wonderful book. You can see a little bit from that post we did on Orthodox Ethos, but it's really great. And then My Life in Christ, I would get from the source, and that is Holy Trinity Monastery uh, and Seminary, uh, Jordanville. All right, go to the Jordanville and get that, get the book from there. It's probably better uh, and good for the press as well, but also better for you. Uh, I don't know, actually, if the price is going to be different. There's another book by Father Stephanos, The Jesus Prayer in the World. And that is uh, actually something I could do a talk on because I have the book and I've, I've read portions of it. And there's another book. Let me actually show you what I might. And let me see if you guys want to, want me to do this. So these are three books 
these are three books uh, that we could use and we could present on the Jesus Prayer. First, first of all, this is a great little book here by New Rome Press. All right, and this is St. John Chrysostom and the Jesus Prayer, a contribution to the study of the Philokalia, Father Maximus. I haven't read this, actually, but it looks very good. Uh, this is the book by Father Stephanos, and you can see there it's uh, another book. I, haven't, I don't know about this translation. I'm assuming it's, it's a good translation, I hope. Uh, St. John Chrysostom, so it's going to probably be a good translation. The monastery in Wisconsin published that. Uh, you can see there the stats. Is that is that blurry? No, there. All right. So if you want to get this book, go to St. John Chrysostom Monastery in Wisconsin. All right. The Jesus Prayer for those living in the world. It's also just like the just like the one on on a divine liturgy. It's all kinds of experiences uh, and and the like. And then this book, little book, is probably unknown to most of you. Can you see that? Uh, I can't. There we go. This is by Archimandrite Arsenios. He is uh, kind of a distant spiritual son of Elder Paisios through his spiritual sons and children. And he, he has a, it's a good book uh, on the Jesus Spirit. So these are the kind of books we could use. I could use um, in a future podcast and get you introduced to these materials and share with you uh, and hopefully help you to get down the road a little bit on the Jesus prayer. How about that? Question from Magdalene. Mag Magdalene. Uh, are the morning and evening prayers in the Orthodox Study Bible the standard prayers we should all do? Um, so I would recommend uh, getting a prayer book. Uh, let me show you one, one prayer book here. Uh, somebody just visited me, a dear soul, and gave me this version, but it's basically the same thing that's from, um, uh, this is a prayer book from Holy Trinity Monastery Seminary, uh, and this is a nice little special edition, all right, and let me show you the uh, title page, prayer book, and in here you're going to have a, a very extensive a very extensive table of contents uh, for morning and evening prayers. And um, I personally use the Transfiguration Monastery Blue Prayer Book, which is very similar to this, but it has a, the Acathist of the Lord Jesus Christ, which I don't think, I don't remember if it has, does it have the Acathist of the Lord Jesus Christ? As the canon, it does have the Acathist. Yeah. So it's pretty much almost identical. And so you got those, those are the traditional prayer books that people have known for 40 years. It's either from Transfiguration Monastery in Boston, which is an old calendars monastery, but very good translations, or the one from Holy Trinity, Jordanville. Um, and they're similar in, in style and approach. But I like the blue one. Why? Because I'm used to the Greek and they translate and you can tr chant that. What they translate is meant to be tra translated to chant. So I use the blue, uh, whereas the Russian is translated to, to basically chant in the Russian tones that, I, that I'm not familiar with. So it's really up to you. But I don't think the Orthodox Study Bible is going to be a sufficient prayer book, uh, Magdalene, for your needs. I think you need to go get something more extensive. All right. So Justin has given us the link for the Holy Transfiguration Monastery. Um, let me actually show it to you, and I can share that with you. All right. So this is this is the prayer book. Let me bring it up on the screen here. That's the prayer book that that uh, has been kind of forever this has kind of forever been the the, the go-to for greek speakers or people are using this is divine services in the greek orthodox world because it has it has all the translations that are chantable in, in byzantine chant so if you're not if you're not a, in a church or you're not used to byzantine chant you really don't need this prayer book but if you are you really probably should go with the blue one 
uh, this one here from the Boston Monastery, um, which, you know, we don't really uh, see eye to eye on the whole question of the ecclesiology, which we think they're, they're, they're not doing so well on, but their translations and their work uh, on liturgical texts is uh, still among the best. That is the uh, actual link to this page and this prayer book. All right. So if you don't have that, I recommend. I recommend. Now, if you want me to pull up the Jordanville prayer book and give you the info on that. So here is that. All right. We'll bring it up on the screen as well. Let me give you share with you um, that page. All right. And then also, this is the link. All right. So that's the bookstore.jordanville.org, Jordanville slash prayer book slash prayer dash books. Anyway, you got it. That's where you want to go for the Jordanville prayer book, $25. It's a pretty good deal. It's a very nice hardcover. And one of those two, all right, one of those two is what I recommend in terms of uh, your prayer life, all right? So Mary's asking a question. This is silly, but why do some priests wear a veil on their caps? Oh, okay, so Mary, you're talking about um, higher monks? Uh, you're talking about higher monks in monasteries, and that's only when they in the they're in the divine liturgy. Uh, let me see if I can get you a picture here to make sure I know what you're talking about. So I think you're talking about this, Mary. Huh? Let me see if this is what you're talking about. Is that what you're talking about? The veil over their hat that goes down below behind them. Is that what you're talking about? That is an ancient, ancient. Let me see if Mary's going to tell me that's what she's talking about. Let me know. Is that if that's what you're talking about? That goes back. That goes back to Saint Pacomios in the fourth century. An angel appeared to him and told him exactly what he needed to wear for the monastics in this great Kenobio, in this great large monastery that had been founded in the Palestinian or actually the Egyptian desert. I think it was Egyptian, wasn't it? It was far, far to the northeast, but it was still on that side of the, the um, Red Sea. Yeah, so that goes back to the 4th, 400, the 4th century, 300s. This is St. Pacomios, the great Cenobitic elder and saint. Go look him up, St. Pacomios. Uh, let me write it up here, Pacomios. And you will learn in the life of St. Pacomios, you will learn all about how an angel of God said, this is what, this, what the monk will wear and how he will, uh, he will be, um, you know, go about his day. You can see this, by the way, in the last picture that I showed, right, right here. See that? This is St. Hieronymus, the newly glorified one on the far right. And also, the this is Father Joachim. He's also wearing it. These are higher monks. They're not married priests, and they wear this over their cocoon, over their um, their scufo. We say in Greek, their hat. See how Father Saint Savas here, the one third from the left. He does. He's not wearing it because he's not in church. But if you're in church, or if you're in a formal setting, you wear that. The monks wear that on Mount Athos and everywhere else. Yeah. So that is. Pretty basic, universal in orthodoxy all around the world. All right. That answer your question, Mary? Okay. Next question is from just, no, from S.D. Berquist. Is there a book by St. John of Cronstadt of letters to his spiritual children? My husband said he thought the title of this book was or article was the spiritual life and how to obtain it. That's from St. Theophon the Recluse. Okay, S.D. Berquist. That is, what's your first name, S.D. Berquist? I don't know the your first name. Let me know your first name. 
that is from Saint Theophon the Recluse, the one you're talking about. The title you just mentioned, the spiritual life and how to obtain to to uh, not to obtain it, but be, be attuned to it. Spiritual life and how to be a, a, attuned to it is by Saint Theophon the Recluse. All right. Uh, Saint John of Cronstadt. I don't know of any a collection of letters of Saint John of Cronstadt. He has his life in Christ, which is his diary, basically, uh, but not uh, a collection of letters. So that is what I'll say about that. Justin has a question. Your blessing. What is your opinion of Saint Tikhon's prayer book, Orthodox Christian Prayers? I don't know it very well, but I don't think I would be drawn to it. I'm pretty sure that their language is not as traditional as I would like. I'm a very I want traditional English. I want traditional English. I'm not satisfied with anything less than traditional English. So I'm I'm not so sure that they're, they're up they're up to that. Uh, and then they're also, um, yeah, I don't know. I can't really speak definitively because I've never sat down and examined it. So I don't want to. I don't want to just pop off. So that's all I can say about that. What was the problem you mentioned between the two groups behind the prayer books, or did I misunderstand or something? So there's 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 two traditional prayer books, Transfiguration Monastery, the Blue Book, and Tran Holy Trinity Monastery, the, the other prayer book with the cross. That's the, the Russian tradition, and the other one is the Greek tradition. So if you're if you're in a Greek-speaking or Greek tradition, Byzantine chant, essentially Byzantine chant, or properly said Roman chant, uh, that is, uh, that's going to be the Blue Book. You're going to want to go with the Blue Book because all of those translations are done to be chanted in byzantine slash roman chant all right so if you're not in that tradition you're in a russian orthodox church or russian orthodox uh, liturgical tradition and chanting then you should go probably should go with the trinity holy trinity monastery edition all right hi seraphima there it is we got sd berquist is seraphima so there we go thank you for sharing with us i like to Say somebody's first name when I'm talking to them. Uh, Clo book is actually not the veil. Jared says Clo book is the question. I don't know if what your uh, Clo book is what the monks wear. Yes, but it's the it's the cap, the hard head, hard hard uh, hat uh, is a Clo book. Now the Russians really don't separate the veil from the Clo book. It's sewn in. So I guess you could say it's also you can also refer to the whole thing as the clo book, but it is different actually. And the Greeks take take off the one without taking off the other. So at different times during the services, and these are kind of technicalities which I don't like to spend a whole lot of time on because there's there's you can figure this out on your own. You can find it. You can read about it. I like to deal with more of the spiritual life stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't know about that prayer book, Mary. Mary's saying, what about the ancient faith prayer book? I really don't know much about it, but I'm guessing they're not using traditional English, so I would not prefer it. I would not recommend it. And I'll, I'll, I'll quote Father George Florovsky, who said that our, our English translation should be several generations, or at least one or two generations, behind the contemporary usage. We should be using traditional English in the Orthodox Church for a variety of reasons, not just because it's more beautiful, but, but because it's more stable and it's more tried and it's more poetic. And so I do not like any modern English versions of prayer books. I think we need to learn how to pray in an exalted, beautiful way. And I think in English, that means, you know, in Greek, it's very ancient. The, 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 the language is ancient. Languages, uh, languages devolve. Right. The more we go, the further we go ahead, the, the, the worse the languages are, the less the poorer they are, at least the way we live them and experience them. There is not much exaltation in the language that we use today. It's been really gutted and there's a lot of in, in, in poverty in terms of our language today. So it's not in our best interest as a church to have very, very contemporary translations. Yes, KGV. Uh huh. Thee and thou. That's that's traditional language, traditional English. What's it called in Greek? I don't know what Lisa's is referring to. What is what called in Greek? All righty, folks. I think I'm going to call it a night unless I see some more questions and I don't see any more. And it's a good chat, but we could. These are things that we could probably figure out in the 
Telegram chat or we can ask in a variety of other chats that, that are out there. And I appreciate your time and your attention. Hopefully this has been very helpful to you. It's opened up the door to a, a literature, not only literature, but experiences of contemporary and ancient saints that teach us what's really going on during the divine liturgy, the spiritual reality behind the forms that we see. Uh, well, in Greek, it's called the kukuli, the, the veil, kukuli. As my, at least that's the, the everyday ter phrase that was used uh, that, I, that I understood in, in Monathos. Nancy, God bless you. We're going to be signing off anyway. God bless you. I'm happy that you're happy, that it's been helpful. You learned a lot. St. John, St. Sergius. You had St. A little bit of everything. You had St. Savas from Mount Athos. You had St. Seraphim from Russia. You have contemporary elders and saints. You got a big spattering of their experience across the board. God bless Good night.